Hello. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Bienvenue. Konnichiwa. And as we say in Okinawa, hi tai. Welcome to Science Plus Art, communicating, or creatively communicating research, where we will hear from five absolutely awesome speakers. Today you're in for a real treat. My name is Heather Young. I'm the Vice President of Communications and Public Relations at OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So we are broadcasting this event as part of the Science Summit at the UN General Assembly. So welcome to everyone here in person and everyone well online. Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Today's event is connected to a SciArt exhibition that you all saw downstairs that's from the Bridge Network. So it includes images of science from OIST in Okinawa, Rockefeller University in the US, the Francis Crick in the UK, and ISTA in Austria. We are grateful to these engaged partners, especially to all the scientists and technical experts that captured and shared their work. If you haven't had a chance to see the exhibit, uh, of course it's here uh, at the UNU. It's entitled Human Model World. Please take time to do so, maybe on your way out. Or for folks watching online, it will be here in Tokyo with free admission for another week and a half. Thank you so much to our partner, UN University, for hosting the exhibit and this session today. Thank you for being a helpful and supportive partner. I would now like to invite Kiki Bowman, the Head of Communications for UNU, to the floor to welcome us to this iconic institution. Kiki, you and your team have been wonderful. Thank you. Please welcome Kiki. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone here to United Nations University, or UNU. My name is Kiki Bowman, and I am the Head of Communications here. Uh, and since we're all gathered here today, I'd like to take a few moments to briefly introduce you and you as we occupy a unique and I think quite interesting space within the UN system. So we are an education and research organization globally comprising of 13 institutes located in 12 countries on five continents. We are also the only UN agency headquartered in Japan. And while each of our 13 institutes has its own focus area, we are one of the few UN agencies that conducts research across all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. As a think tank for the UN system, we are not a traditional university. However, four of our, four of our 13 institutes offer masters or PhD programs. For the last 50 years, we have been a trusted knowledge partner to the UN while keeping our autonomy as a research and training organization. We're solutions focused. That approach puts us to build research partnerships that can address the world's pressing problems at local, national, and global levels. So what does this mean in practice? Our activities span across a wide range of topics like climate change, gender, health, digital innovation, AI, finance, biodiversity, and water, to name but a few. Our goal is to build knowledge to transform the world. And our research, education, publications, training, and capacity building programs are as diverse and interconnected as the current challenges we face. I cannot begin to touch on all of our research, education, publication, training, capacity. I can't, it's, it's too vast. But because we're here in Japan, I'll talk just briefly about some of our, our research at UNU IAS. Uh, the, the institute that's located in this building. So uh, one of the things that they do here is they work with local communities in Japan that uses the traditional techniques of agriculture and fishing. These communities have adapted to their landscapes, preserved the biodiversity of their region, and are still able to thrive off the land and the sea. The research here focuses on the maintenance and development of social economic activities that align and support biodiversity and natural processes. Essentially, how does the traditional inform the new? Creativity, it has been said, is finding the connection between two disparate ideas. I could argue that finding ways in which traditional techniques inform modern society is a form of, is a form of creativity. As those of us who work in the fields that, that straddle science and these artistic or creative worlds, we know the creativity, imagination, and rigor that goes into both fields. 
Art and science both had the potential to inform, inspire, and transform, using them together as a powerful tool to reach new audiences in new ways. So I really look forward to today's talks. I look forward to hearing all of them and to learning from you all. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Kiki. We have five speakers today over the next about one and three quarters hours. And this will include a small networking break after the first three. But before we do that. Let's block out our phones and our emails. Let's give our undivided attention to these speakers. Let's have our imagination be ignited and our work be inspired. First up, Ileana Mendoza is an art historian, a curator, an exhibition coordinator, and a consultant at OIST. Over the past few years, she has been exploring the intersections between art and science and implementing sci art activities as an important tool to effectively communicate scientific later. labor. Start us off, Ileana. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm very happy to see familiar faces and new faces. I am Ileana Mendoza. I am a science and art consultant for OIST. And uh, I'm gonna jump into the talk because we have limited time. So more than words, using images of science uh, to reach broader audiences. And of course, this talk is connected with the exhibition downstairs, the uh, images of science. I hope you have uh, uh, some time to check it out. And if not, please do so. And please fe feel free to approach me if you have questions, if you want to know more about the images or about the process. Um, so uh, as an introduction, first of all, I want to really give a very broad uh, definition of images of science so we are all on the same page. So they are images generated by different processes and techniques for the purpose of scientific research, analysis, or data visualization. And these images allow scientists to visualize processes and structures at different scales, from macro to micro. Thus, contributing uh, on advancing our understanding of different fields of science and of the really, really of the world around us. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is uh, showcasing the significance and variety of scientific images and their role in science communication. And to do so, I want to use some of like OIS Images of Science projects as a case study. First of all, an historical perspective, just to keep all, everyone like more, and we go back in time, because early scientists used illustrations and drawings to document their observation. And it was a very useful tool to like, you know, promote and diffuse the art. Uh, the science, sorry. Um, as an example of this, of course, we have Copernicus, the heliocentric model. This is an image taken from like that NASA website with like that translation on the left of the Latin word. And of course, this was important to have um, um, uh, drafts like this along that, that idea to actually come across better, like, you know, more understand, like uh, facilitate to understand the concept. And second place, Leonardo da Vinci, we all have seen these illustrations, anatomical illustrations. They are very, very useful. And even now, if you open a book of anatomy and of surgery, you can have this illustration. And it's fundamental to understand uh, the techniques and like the, the knowledge of the body. Uh, continuing with the historical perspective, um, there's obviously an evolution of science imaging. And uh, we went from transition from drawings, even though drawings are still used, less and more now though, uh, to photography and advanced imaging techniques to enhance accuracy and communication of science. And sometimes of the some types of scientific images are microscopic images, medical imaging, data visualization, art and science collaboration, and astrophotography. As examples of like the new types of images, I selected this image. This is a flagship image of the exhibition for OIS here in Japan, and it was uh, by a, um, a student, a PhD student, um, is a cellular uh, aging image. So when the first time I saw it, I was this, what is this? Is this the universe? What I'm looking at? And it was exactly that point where we want to capture with this exhibition. What is this? I want to know more. And that's why we selected this beautiful piece as like the flagship image of, of our exhibition here in Japan. And um, I also want to show this image. And probably everybody has seen this image. This image went viral around the world. It's called The Pillars of Creation. It was released by um, NASA, from, taken from the James Webb uh, Telescope. And I really want to focus on this, the power of these images to capture our imagination and to capture our attention. That is a very, very important. And that is what like, a current technology can achieve now. 
So the role of images of science in sci uh, images in scientific communication they enhance the understanding because because of course they make they simplify complex ideas both for the scientists but also for the public. Some of these images obviously like go to the public, but like the real role of these images is to communicate science against your peers. And <clears throat> these visual representations help in cross-disciplinary communication, also very important. Sometimes people from different fields, it's very, very difficult to grasp the concept. So the image can help with that, facilitating like the understanding. And in terms of public engagement, well, a viral, viral science images are fantastic. This image that we just um, saw before, the one released by NASA, I saw it everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. And that is the power of the image. And that is what we really want to like, you know, harvest how like image can really like spark your imagination and take you further in the knowledge of science. And images in science media, of course, spark curiosity and interest in scientific topics. That's what they are very, very helpful. And examples of scientific images in connection with exhibitions are all over the world. Uh, Max Planck has this amazing um, image of science exhibition. Um, I think it's yearly because they have, I don't know, 70 institutes under them. So it's a lot of images constantly produced. Uh, Spain also has an co uh, annual contest of images of science. And all these images are um, exhibited in the different um, spaces of uh, natural museums across Spain. And also, uh, the Science Gallery at the University of Tokyo, I recently had a peek, and I, I could see that they strategically use images of science again to help with like, you know, promoting science and provide a better understanding of very complex idea. <clears throat> the Images of Science project, well, this uh, project, the exhibition came from like the anniversary. So we wanted to celebrate our 10th anniversary and we're thinking, well, how we can do this? We want to create an exhibition, but how, what is the be best way to do it? So we really call out for like the Images of Science across the Institute to give us 10 years of like science, of always science. And um, the researchers were fantastic. They sent lots of images. And really, like, the exhibition is a visual journey into the work of all researchers, providing us a glimpse into their contributions to science. These images are informative and educational, but they also reflect a very fascinating nature of science. They are, wow, they are very, very, very um, uh, beautiful images in, itself, in themselves. So this is part of like, this actually images is one of my favorite. Not a lot of people like insect <laughs> images, but I really, really like it. This is an ant and most of the brain is made out of muscle and that's why they have like the fastest strapped. So that is very, very interesting. And this is part of that 10th anniversary exhibition project. And from this project, we have spin-off projects. We have like um, uh, the science behind the art and we created an amazing display for the Tunnel Gallery. Uh, so it was a design with motifs of images of science and then these motifs, you can access a QR code and t they will tell you more about the motif uh, that is in the hanging banner. Um, and then, of course, it came also the project of Bridge Network to call with, uh, work with our partners from the Bridge Network. And this was a very, very interesting collaboration because it was like different institutes, different countries, different um, um, ways of thinking, ways of seeing science. And we all came together and, you know, to produce a fantastic exhibition. I'm very, very proud of it because we are showing what like, our researchers are doing, which are something that we're really, really proud of. <clears throat> So these are the OIST images of science always comes with a process. So first of all, we have an internal engagement with the researchers. We really want to motivate the researchers to send us images. So we can like, these images are used for this project, for the exhibition and, um, of the images of science. And if they are not used for this project, these images are going to use any well because they are part of our archive and we always can use them. <clears throat> After the um, researchers send us the images, there's a careful selection and curator process. So I'd like to focus on this um, selection process because it's not only us, done us by CPR, it's done by faculty members and members of OIS research community. Why is it so important to have this wholesome approach? Because uh, for some images that could be very, very like, that work a lot in terms of visual for CPR, maybe for the science community, other, well, they are not so good how they are not so good. I have an example. Uh, one of the images for the Bridge Network that the CPR people was very, very happy with it. Uh, faculty members from other fields were like, oh, this, this is very an interesting image. But when we talk with the image section at OIS, one of the members of imaging section, she said, this is a good image, but it's not the best image that you can create with this technique. And this is why it's important to have a wholesome approach. Because 
these images are all gonna, are gonna be seen and somehow judged by peer scientists. So it's an image that has to be powerful, but also a good image in terms of science. That's what we want to collect. Science that can you know, transform, that can well. And after this uh, pro a careful selection and a curated process, uh, there comes the science communication exercise with the authors. So one of the powerful um, components of the project is also have powerful descriptions. And descriptions that are easy to understand for like the wider audience. And that is a very interesti interesting exer exercise between the authors, between the scientists and CPR, because sometimes it's not easy. The authors are so proud of the science, so proud of the images, but sometimes they really have to like, work with us to make everyone of us understand and be wowed by it. And after, this, after you have to go through all this process, you obviously have different deliverables, like exhibitions on sites, exhibitions online, brochures, and different material that can be very helpful. This is like the uh, part of the displays that we create for the Oyster Tunnel Gallery in 2021. And when we changed that displays, actually these beautiful banners went to other, type, uh, other parts of Oyster. So it's a kind of a sustainable practice to create some displays that then will be like, you know, good displays for the different areas of the Institute. And um, uh, lessons learned. So obviously through all this process, there are, there's a lot of lessons learned because it's not easy. It's not an easy process. And science imaging has limitations. We are not talking about big resolution images because that's not the purpose. Uh, researchers are working in their experiments and they produce a, a, a science imaging with like the um, technology available. And this technology available sometimes doesn't have like big high resolution outcome. So we are very respectful of that. We don't want to modify anything of the image because that is like the wow factor that we're looking for. Uh, we also ask the researcher just send us the file as it is and don't try to like, you know, make it higher or, or, um, or like expand like that, that resolution of the image. Let us like, you know, look at it first. And then if perhaps it's a, we can like, you know, expand a little bit that resolution, we will do that. But that is the only thing that we want to do to the image because there's no artistry extra added to the images. These images are images of science. They are scientific images um, that are like conceived after a whole process. Um, another lesson learned is authorship and copyright. I thought about, uh, I talked before about archives, so images can go to the archive. And one important lesson learned from here is that every time, every image that is in the archive is always good practice to go back to the author and to check in. Are you okay to, okay, to distribute this image, is the authorship correct? Because as any other you know, product in life, um, there can be some like, you know, contested authorship and we need to know that. It's really like a risk that can be like, uh, uh, avoided just to talk to the author. Immediately contact the author and just check that oh, copyright, everything's okay. Um, and again, the challenge of science communication is another lesson that um, we want to work a lot with like, all the authors, with the researchers, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to communicate both sides. So it is still how we can communicate science efficiently, how to communicate the science in, in an engaging way with the image, but also we need a text that could be like, you know, easy to kind of like understand for someone like me. I don't, I don't come from like necessarily for a science background. So the challenge of science communication is always like a process that goes on with every um, product of science communication that comes out. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a challenge to understand both worlds. Um, and also an important thing that comes from this project is like the open conversation between science, art, and science, and sci art. And I have found myself several times talking to my team because they, were, they are like, oh, this work of art, the part of the, for the collection, I said, it's not a work of art, it's a science image. So we frame it within like an exhibition as part of that collection. It's a piece in an exhibition, but above all, this is a science, uh, scientific image. And we have to have that very, very clear. So, but I love it that it opens this conversation of what is science, what is art, what is science art. And we have sci amazing science art practitioners here. And I really, really want to hear your opinion <coughs> about these discussions. <laughs> and uh, as a conclusion, well, the importance of scientific images in discovery and edu uh, education and communication is undeniable. This is a, um, OIST Images of Science is a project as a project is a medium to use these existing images for outreach purposes with the aim of igniting curiosity in our audiences. And it has been um, a very welcome project in Okinawa and in other places that we have taken the images. And um, the future of scientific imaging, the new trends and challenges. And challenges I really highlight 
the AI-driven imaging that is like taking us in another challenge in terms of copyright, in terms of like the image itself. Um, so it's something that we have to think about and that will come to sign more often. And it's something that we have to deal in the future, but something that we have to be, have a, they're very present in their minds when working with these type of projects. All these images, um, we made um, emphasis and saying, this time we're not accepting AI-generated images just because we are starting to work in the process of how we can present the type of imagery. And finally, least but not last, uh, last but not least, <laughs> sorry, all science and art at the glimpse. So we have had past projects of science and art at OIS. We are like adding more structure to the, and system to what we want to call our science and art project. Uh, so please, you know, stay tuned. But as past projects, we had like, a, for example, collaborations with Joyoma. He worked with the um, Cognitive Science Unit in this fantastic uh, performance and experiment of uh, um, synchronizing heartbeats while listening to music. It was beautiful. Uh, we also support the Shell of Time by Yun Yamada and Takashi Ikegami, which was a dancer with 300 robots on stage and also using VR um, uh, equipment. Uh, recently, we, had we hosted Fascination of Science, which is a series of portraits used by Her Herlin de Cobble, and it was, it was beautiful like that. The gallery looked beautiful, and the, the portraits caught so much attention and were so inspiring. And as future projects, we're coming with a fantastic co collaboration with Sputnik. Please stay tuned. This collaboration is coming very, very soon. And next year, we are have scheduled um, an Oyster and Sony CSL collaboration. And I know that uh, Nick Luscom and uh, Sean Kalsahara can perhaps you know, give us a little bit like a peek of what like, is to come. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, sorry, I was going so fast. Please, <laughs> waiting for your questions. Any questions from the audience? Yep. Do you want to move to Tokyo and work at LC? <laughs> <laughs> I, I so. love I love Tokyo. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not my question, but we can talk about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, so one of the uh, interesting things at working at a research institute is that when you, whenever you say art, there's always a very small group of scientists who are like, I love art, I'm happy to join. But what about the rest of the scientists? How do you, what, what's that conversation is like? How do you actually uh, get them to be interesting and I, interested? I think the value of this project, like the image of the science, is that uh, the artists are very, very, the authors, the um, researchers are very keen to show the images. And they are very keen to show the images outside of the context of these journals of science. So that is a very good attractive for the authors. And once they get into that and they, they start talking to us of how like, I com communicate my image, they have a bit of, of a better of an understanding of the implications of science and art and art and science. So um, I think this is a good project to start the, the, the researchers thinking about like, you know, creatively thinking about their output of research. And then we have researchers like Sean, I, I love, personally love uh, Sean's work, that a lot of his research um, is also like thinking perhaps of how it could work in art. I think that's the way it goes. And, uh, and I think the value of this is that we kind of start thinking, sparkle that thing about that, the researchers of, well maybe these images you know, can be shown to the public and maybe I can do something else and how can we co collaborate and then they come to us, and then we have like artists visiting, and we say, well, you, per you, you could have a great conversation because this artist is interested in marine science, and you're like an expert in marine science, and they really connect. And when we kind of establish this connection between artists and, and um, researchers, it's very, very, um, it's, I'm grateful for that because it's sometimes so hard, you know, to communicate from apparently two different worlds, but they are not so different, because I think creativity, as Kiki said, the sparkle of creativity is the same in artists and science. It's like this, this eager to like know more about things that kind of drive a lot of people, both scientists and both artists. So I don't know if that answers your question, Delina. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Nick Luscombe is a London and Tokyo based sound architect, field recordist, sound health researcher, radio broadcaster, producer, and DJ. All this in addition to being the artistic director of OIST's Sonic Lab. Welcome, DJ Nick. Thank you very much. So yeah, that's me, Nick Luscombe. I'm the OIST Sonic Lab uh, artistic director. Um, thank you for joining and for joining online if you're online. So um, back in April, we started this brand new project called the OIST Sonic Lab. And basically we're listening to the, round, the, the, the world around us. We're listening to get clues as to how we can improve our sense of well-being and wellness. And we use kind of art, but basically I'm thinking of art as music in this presentation. So a little bit of background. Um, I mean, Heather gave a great kind of roundup, but I kind of work in radio mostly. I make a lot of different radio programs, produce music. Um, and my more serious jobs have included working at uh, the Institute of Contemporary Arts, where I was the director of music in London. And also for around um, eight years in total, I worked for iTunes and Apple, looking at um, kind of streaming and downloading of music. Um, so I've kind of a very sort of varied background, um, which has kind of led me to really wonder about music and the power of music. Um, for me, this is a, a really inspirational album by the Miracles from mid seventies. But I just kind of love the the quote of um, of the title track of the album, talking about spiritual. How music is kind of very spiritual. It can work miracles. So it kind of feels a little bit like not very scientific in that respect. We kind of feel we know what we do with music. It's one of the reasons it's so popular is because we don't need to kind of overthink it. Um, just to talk about the power of music as well, just to prove how popular it is as an art form. I mean, this, the kind of numbers of music are, are staggering. You know, trillions of people um, streaming music just in the US alone in, in 2023. Everyone around the world, pretty much on average, listens to about 60 minutes of music every day. And that's through choice. That's not including when you go to the supermarket. Um, and then just the number of new tracks every day, 120,000 new pieces of music are being uploaded every day to all the DSPs. So that's iTunes, Apple Music, um, Spotify. And then, yeah, the global revenue is huge as well. So, I mean, the figures are just incredible. So clearly, we're a world that loves music. Um, this is a personal favorite record of mine from the 80s called Einsteiner Gogo -Go by Landscape. Anyone know that record? Maybe not, right? No, just me. <clears throat> okay, but um, a great way of communicating science. I think you'll agree, quite obvious. Um, the band performed on a, a TV show called Top of the Pops, watched by millions. And um, I think a lot of people, including me, really understood um, Einstein through this record. I didn't really know much about him before this. So it's a very obvious uh, way to communicate um, science and scientists. Um, so back to the Sonic Lab. So a project we've worked on, um, the Okinawa Sound Portrait project, where we basically recorded different sounds around the island. And we also worked with two units at OIS, so the marine unit. And they very kindly um, took us out on a boat. We went to the coral reef and we dropped hydrophones uh, into the water to record the sounds of the coral. And thankfully, the coral around there is, is really healthy. It's really vibrant. And you can listen to the sounds of all these incredible noises under the ocean. So clickings and the kind of, um, you know, I imagine there are seahorses having communications and all this beautiful life beneath the ocean that we can't normally see. Um, and like Ileana was saying, to me, that's, that's art. That's kind of, um, kind of the cosmos making its own kind of version of a, of a symphony. You know, it's beautiful. Um, but it's also scientific, right? Because we're listening to the health of that coral reef through those kind of very vibrant sounds. And so we captured those sounds alongside um, the sounds from, for example, um, there's me recording a waterfall in Okinawa just to get the kind of white noise aspect of this. The ocean, of course. Um, and then the traditional sanshin instrument as well, which we recorded as part of this project. And we also worked with a visual artist, uh, Ichiro Kikuta, who is an incredible artist, lives in Okinawa. So it's a very kind of multi-layered project. And if I go back to the previous slide, it kind of lives in this space at the Hyatt Hotel. So as a piece of um, kind of bringing together scientists, I guess, to create an art piece, I feel it's, it's kind of done a, a pretty good job. And also, thanks to the fact that we can display the work in a public space, it means that many people get to know about the work. They get to know about the science behind it. And hopefully, they also get to relax and enjoy these sounds as well. So this is our kind of first Sonic Lab project, which is clearly 
you know, promoting science through art and art being music. Um, for me, there are, there are always challenges. I think, um, again, Eliana touched on copyright issues, things like that. But I think when we work with artists, we have to bear in mind that, um, you know, art is largely kind of ego driven. It's all about the artist's view on the world. And I think there is a slight kind of change with this in that there's almost like a mission, I think, for me anyway, that um, art for art's sake is very important. I think more important than ever, but also I think people feel a responsibility that their time could be spent also on creating art, but art with meaning when this time of you know, climate emergency, when we're trying to understand our place in the world and what we can do to help. Um, so I think those are the challenges, but clearly there are huge benefits to kind of working with artists, communicating quite often very difficult concepts through, through art. And for example, there's, um, there are some scientists that sonify their data so they can listen to the data. When, when the, you know, reading it is great. A lot of figures is in, interesting. But when you listen, sometimes you can pick out things that you wouldn't normally read because you get number blind or the stats are just you know, quite hard to, to manage. So there are benefits on that level and then the communication of that through art. Again, the way that Ileana was talking about some of these beautiful uh, images, which are not art, really, but who knows, right? It's a kind of gray area. In terms of people who do this really well, there's a festival in, in the UK called the Blue Dot Festival, which um, I haven't actually been to, but um, would love to go one day. But you can see the kind of level of uh, musicians that they engage for this um, festival. And the idea is you, you come and see Kraftwerk or New Order or Björk, and then before you know it, you're part of um, this huge kind of scientific discovery. So it's a really clever way of, of kind of tricking people into... <laughs> into kind of engaging with quite deep scientific kind of uh, propositions and experiments. And so I think this is an incredible example of really high end um, and a beautiful way to communicate science through art. It just seems to work really, really well. And I think, um, you know, we have opportunities in Japan next year. So Expo is coming 2025 um, in Osaka, but I'm sure it'll have ripples around the whole of Japan. And millions of people are going to be engaging. And my hope is that you know, one of my huge inspirations is Expo 70 and some of the music that was kind of pioneered at that time um, and some of the science that went behind it. For example, this is the, um, the Steel Pavilion Space Theatre, which had a very scientific approach to the distribution of sound within the space. So it's all bound up in architecture, um, acoustics, and, and the composers they work with to create the music for this space. People like um, Stockhausen and Joji Uasa, for example, um, we're really on that boundary of kind of art and science, and but in such a popular way, you know, millions of people went to Expo 70, and so I don't know if it's going to happen, but I hope that there'll be similar kind of opportunities at Expo 25 for us to explore the emerging sciences of today um, together with artists. So I have no idea if that was 10 minutes or not, but it felt like it went very quickly. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, please, yeah, fire away. Oh, and I'm going to play, this is the soundtrack to the Hi-Hat um, playing in the background. So this is the, yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question for you and then the first speaker. Um, you have wonderful work of visual and sound art. But what kind of um, insights do you have about um, inclusive points of view <laughs> Sorry, for yeah. people who doesn't um, hear or who doesn't see? I'm asking because this um, point of view includes more people join in science and so on. Sure. So, sorry, do you mean people who, who are unable to hear and talking about the, the work that we're doing at Sonic Lab, for example, being sound-based? Is that what you mean? Sorry, I don't understand your question. <laughs> Could you <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Are you, are you asking me about, um, so with the work we're doing, kind of, is sound-based, sound and music? Oh. Are, you, are you saying, how about people who are una unable to hear the work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, okay. Um, well, obviously, I mean, my approach is, I guess, that we're looking at, the fact that we're very visually led, and we think we're very visually led as a, as a kind of, as humans. Um, and, you know, my thing is that sonics are really important, the sound is very important, but obviously many, many people cannot hear this. So what I'm hoping is that there is a lot of um, emerging technologies to help people with, learning, uh, with um, hearing difficulties, 
to be able to kind of feel the the sound waves through you know vibrational um, so there are wearables that are coming on the market that do this also we're exploring the use of hypersonic sound which is a sound that even people with good hearing are unable to hear because the frequencies are so high so this is um, work that we were um, working on with the scientist who does a lot of recordings in the Borneo rainforest. And the frequencies you get from rainforests are, again, inaudible, but they're incredibly beneficial. So we're going to be looking at that. But, um, but yeah, a lot of this work is kind of sonically based. That's, that's part of it. Yeah. Thank you for your question. And you're totally right. We have to make these breaks more inclusive. And this is a challenge, of course, because this is visually based. Um, so also, I'm, I'm not hoping a lot about future technologies because I don't know like, the future, what the future holds. But uh, there's definitely um, a challenge to make this more approachable. And we are thinking about it. This is just the start of the project. And I'm also thinking that perhaps working with artists, they can help us like, find a way to make these images more like, you know, approachable and more like um, for, for people with different capacities. Yes. Thank you, for, thank you so much for your question. Make me think a lot. Thanks. Uh, one more question? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah, have we got time? Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out this Mac. It's got one of those bars on it, which I'm not really familiar with. So, um, one second. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, technology. I'm not sure about this. Hang on, it should be playing, but I can't hear it. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's in the background now. It's kind of waves and then it goes into the different sounds. <laughs> it's a very slow fade in. And you can basically hear the different birds that, that are processed, for example. long so it, it really evolves quite slowly before you hear like the seahorses for example thank you so much thank you so much nick i know nick has to make a little bit of a quick exit at some point so we won't take it personally Thank you. Next up, Ayatsupoi carries out research on outreach activities that inspire the fusion of natural science, philosophy, and art at the Kavli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe. In addition, she is a founder of Fundamentals, a multi-institutional platform for collaboration between science and artists. Aya, the flyer, floor is yours. Okay, for... Thank you for coming, and my name is Aya Tsuboi, and I am the police officer at Kabuli IBMU. And usually I organize public programs at Kabuli IBMU, but today I would like to introduce fundamental the program. This is a cross-disciplinary exchange platform based on fundamental dialogues between scientists and artists. And so let me introduce who we are, who organized this program. So I belong to this Japan Association of Communication Through Science and Technology. Tomomi, who invited me, she is also a member of this. And I set up public relations working group in collaboration with adjacent fields. And this is a member who organized this program together. So I am from the University of Tokyo, and the other from the National Institute of Genetics and Osaka University and Kyoto University and so on. And so this program is a very basic program. So maybe people who are here, it's mainly people are very taking care of science, belong to science or helping developing science. So I'd like to ask, What's the main point or the main steps, most important point? What is the most important point? 
I think the very first, point, first part, thinking, is a very important point. So let's remind the, a poet, Soro. He put a hat in 19, uh, 1854 beside a, very, beside a river. And because he would like to think deeply. So I would like to create this situation. I mean, scientists and artists get together and think deeply. And also, I'd like to bring this situation to the general public and not making it easy to understand, just for less as it is. So this is our challenge. Hmm. Now you can see the document of our program. We call this is Fundamentals Bazaar, and uh, later you can see Fundamentals Festival. Our program is a uh, yearly program. Every March, we open call for science and artists. And then in summer, we make a two days programs. And artists and the scientists explain what the main point of their interest without images or very limited images. Because, you know, using images is very effective. You know, the presentation before me, power of image is very strong. But we need to explain because background of artists and scientists is totally different. So we need to talk deeply without images. And then we also invite the philosopher to facilitate the communication between artists and the science. The also artists and the science talk one on one, of course. And then they make a pair, one on one relationships between scientists, artists. And then they keep this communication six months or seven months. And after that, we ask them share the process of their development with general public. This is the Fundamentals Festival. And we organized this program almost three years. So three years communication artists and scientists makes a kind of artwork. But a year communication scientist artist period doesn't have much artworks. They have just inside the process of making artworks. But I ask them, please share the process. Because this is the most important point, thinking and challenging everything. So this is a fundamental festival we call. And so who joins? We have 50 participants from diverse fields. Some do is urban is environmental studies and of course mathematics, physics, and brain science, and so on. And also from artists, usually media artists or the bio artists join these programs, but basically artists doesn't have such high technologies. Painter or sculptor or photographer join our program. And they make 32 pairs were formed, and the 32 pairs is now working together. And what people said, left side is a feedback from participants, from artists and the scientists. You see, almost 100% are satisfied of our program. And personal growth, and learning the discovery, and mutual respect. And right side is a feedback from event attendees. This is a survey who joined the Fundamental Festival last year, December, we held, and you saw the slideshow just before. And 62% people satisfied this event, and 23% of people feel the impression of the science. I mean, they shift the image of the science. I mean, before, he, before they have some image about the science or image about art, but after she, our show, their image has changed. So I think people have some impression about our 
shows as well. And let me introduce some of our ex example of artworks. This is a collaboration between drawings and project things to artists and mathematicians. And you know, mathematicians think about uh, um, geometry things, but this is very complicated, so we can't imagine because they think about not three-dimensional, four-dimensional, five-dimensional, six-dimensional, so we can't imagine. So artists decide to make a line. You can see the specific line here. So, and you can touch these lines because they have uh, something like a surface. So if you follow the lines, you can imagine the imaginal figures in your mind. So this is how to explain the figures which you can't make appear in 3D worlds. And the other I images is the workshops. This is held by artists and scientists together at the, as artworks at the art exhibition place. So usually scientists make uh, workshops, but this is a workshop by artists and scientists. So you can feel mathematical things um, hosted by, uh, helped by artists. So you can feel something, mathematical things, physically, because of artists. So this is a very characteristic art, uh, workshops. And this is the other artwork from our peers. Artists usually do sculpture and drawing and making these sculpture and drawing with its real plants. And the developmental biologist, they together make works. And title is Insect Life. Maybe it's difficult to see, but uh, these things are the ficus, feces, feces, insect feces. So they pick up many kinds of insect feces and make tea. <laughs> so, you know, feces, feces is the, uh, for scientists, feces is uh, their things they will study. But for the artist, this is a kind of uh, things they can feel. So they try to open up this kind of communication to the general public as well. And the center of this one is uh, drawings using ficus as well. So this is a special paper. So put the ficus and then put some water. There is some many pattern of color appears. And artists use these things and make drawings like this. And also, we made a metabath things because the process of art and the science working together is kind of very not easy to understand. Because before, I said I would like to bring the forest where people, your artists and the scientists, think together the forest. I would like to bring this forest as it is. So, but it is very difficult and it not usual. So I need to establish something new, something new to show these experiences. So I would like to make metaverses. Um, I pick, I made up exhibitions at the um, online base area, something like that. So, yeah, I can show, you can try these metabas things later, so please contact me. And um, we organized this program three years already, and next year we try to do another series of fundamentals program, and we would like to do this one shift to the uh, Yamaguchi prefecture. Last 
three months, last three years, we did it at uh, Tokyo. But maybe it's very nice if people can join these things across the Tokyo. So I started to do these things at the Yamaguchi Prefecture, and then we tried to do things, spread the talk, spread the Japan as well. And also, we would like to public, we would like to make online journal as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Yukiko Nakahari. I work uh, in communications um, at the University of, uh, I should know my office, at the United Nations University. <laughs> I work with Kiki. Um, thank you so much. It, that, your project sounds absolutely fascinating. Um, can you share with us maybe some feedback that you received from participating scientists and artists and what they gained from it? I'm particularly interested in knowing what the scientists found and maybe how uh, this participating in this project has hel uh, helped them in their, uh, in their work? Actually, this is a very difficult point because, you know, art, communication with art, communication with artists and scientists, basically maybe benefit is for artists. Yeah, they can make <laughs> art pieces. But I can see all scientists and all artists look very, very happy. Because, you know, it's very difficult to concentrate on very fundamental questions at their research as well. Because everyone asks scientists, artists as well, what you made. And made something very nice, something like that. But actually, people don't want to do something nice. They want to do something very interesting. Well, what they want to know or something like that. And this is the situation for that. This is the fullest. People can do that. So scientists look very happy because they do something very fundamental things. So I think this is a very important point. Thank you, Aya. Thank you so much for sharing your, ex I, your experience. And I'd like to focus on that word experience because I think what you're telling us is at the end, the experience is like what the shared process mm. of producing the work of art based on science. And even like that, that really like interesting piece about like the, the tea of uh, insect yeah. feces, I think it's also about this experience of like this transgression. And this tra transgression comes a little bit from like art and science, you know, from both sides. Both of them want yeah. to, like, reach mm -hmm. something else, no? So I think the experience in, in general is really valuable. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very complex to, like, really, like, reach this communication with science and artists. Mm -hmm. And when you find, like, science and artists that communicate, like, very efficiently, I think mm -hmm. it is like, you, I don't know, what would you think, Nick? Because it's, it's and yes, sometimes, yes, it is like that. The benefit is perhaps more for the mm -hmm. artists because scientists have, like, another way of, like, you know, mm -hmm dealing with their, their, their outcomes and their deliverables. But I think it still is a very valuable exper experience for both yeah. sides. Mm -hmm. So I think that really needs to be highlighted, the experience and, and you know, what can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Thanks Thank you. so much. Yeah, <laughs> Thank very you. interesting. Thank you. Tomomi, do we still have time for a 10-minute break? Okay. Okay, excellent. We are now going to, to take a 10-minute networking break. You will find refreshments in Okinawa Omiyagi at the back of the room. Please use this time to connect, meet new people. Let's strengthen our communication networks and find ways we can work together. We'll see you in 10 minutes. Excellent. Please grab a seat. It's both a, a wonderful job and a terrible job to have to break up that kind of li lively conversation. <laughs> but we'll have a little bit of time at the end. Oh, we're doing door prizes first, aren't we, Tomomi? Yes. Okay. I'm passing the mic over to Tomomi for some prizes. Now? 
So at the reception, I think you have received a seat to fill out, to meet three, at least three people that you have never met before and uh, fill, fill in their names and affiliations and uh, their favorite artist or scientist. So please fill out and you will get uh, a great gift from Waste. Thank you. Well, they have to pass it in you uh, at the end. Oh, you're doing it now? Okay, pass it in. Sorry, pass it in to Natsu at the back there. At the end? At the end. Don't get up now. <laughs> at the end, and then you'll get a treat. Okay, excellent. Okay, next up. Dr. Thalina Hinatigala is from ELSI, the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Tech, where he leads public relations, teaches science communication to grad students, supervises SciComm internships, and coordinates science and society projects. His research interests include public engagement evaluation, astrobiology communication, and decolonizing science. He is one of the co-organizers of the Japan SciComm Forum, which will be held next month. Little plug there. Welcome, Felina. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back after that short break. So I work at a research institute that we are focused on uh, origin of life and astrobiology. And I will tell you how do we go from here to art. But before that, uh, I have always been in, quite interested in art, mainly, I think, because of my family. Uh, nobody in my family is from science, but they are from art and creative side. And they're very proud of it. And they always look at me as a black sheep. And uh, uh, my father is a fashion designer. He design, He used to design beautiful wedding dresses, wedding gowns, saris, and so on. And uh, my family organized uh, part of the Colombo Fashion Week uh, for 30 years. So everybody is doing like very creative. All of them can really, they're really good at karaoke. And I think I'm the one who can't sing in the family. And uh, so, but that influence still, you know, existed as a child and as an adult. So some, about 15 years ago, when, I, when we were doing, uh, when I was uh, part of astronomy community, uh, one of the things I was actually doing was like combining astronomy and art. And around 2010, uh, we started this uh, a project called, me and another colleague called Astro Arts, where we got as artists around the world who are working on astronomy, inspired by astronomy for one month online, and we had like live uh, performances, pianists, violinists, and live drawing artists, conversations. And it was such an interesting time, uh, which I continued for about four or five years. This program is still going. And then I moved to Japan about six, seven years ago. Uh, and this is what I'm dealing with now. So. Uh, this is our whole scope of what we do at our institute, astrobiology and origin of life. For us, this is very exciting, and I'm always excited about the science we do. But everybody else outside of our school, it looks very boring and looks way too complicated. And we even name this as squid diagram. I don't know if you see, see a squid. But that's the level of artistic uh, creativity that we came up like, oh, let's call it a squid diagram. And, uh, but all of these is what we are doing. And we sort of came up with the, okay, let's have a better version of it that we start from all the way from Big Bang to planet formation and what we are studying right now at LC. And uh, so we ended up with this. Uh, but I still wanted to bring art into our institute and continue my personal interest in art. So we set up this, as soon as I, one of the things I uh, did as soon as I joined was to set up this science art program at uh, LC. And it was really interesting uh, to come in from astronomy and then to astrobiology, now I'm in astrobiology, to look at these fundamental questions in astrobiology, like where does life origin origins and what is how does the life actually, what are the life ingredients and so on. These are very fundamental questions for scientists, but also for public. Anytime you mention uh, to like at a public event, I'm in astrobiology, these are the same question they ask. 
But interestingly for artists, this is also very inspirational. You know, life in the universe is such an inspirational uh, component for artists. So we started looking at how do we sort of combine science and art and sort of very go from very deductive way and logical thinking to imagination based and creative based and sort of have this wonder back to science. And uh, and it's while doing this process, we wanted to keep in mind who is our audience, like who are we doing this for? And so we are doing it for ourselves, for scientists, because as scientists we have a, unfortunately we have a really, I would almost call it toxic way of thinking about the scientific cycle where you think of a problem, you write a grant, maybe you get the grant, if you get the grant, you do the research, you publish, and then you go to the next. So this is basically the same process for every single scientist. And it's a system we set up, and hopefully we'll change, but if you go a couple of hundred years ago, scientists were philosophers. It was more about thinking, imagination-based, but now the funding system doesn't support such a thing. So we need to think a bit differently, how do we sort of change that? And that's where actually we bring in artists, because artists, if you, if you, it's, it's something you can never ask an artist, uh, like a painter, are you finished, are you done? Or what are you drawing? Because sometimes they have an idea, sometimes most of them, they don't know, like it's a creative process that ongoing. And it's very different from scientific process. So how do we sort of bring that into, sort of disrupt the way we do science? And that's one of the key goals in uh, this program. So in the science art program at LC, we have, the, uh, we have an artist in resident every year focused on origin of life and astrobiology. And uh, the artists conduct these art and design workshops uh, for the scientists and with the scientists. So it's a different uh, kind of workshop where sometimes you give a workshop on creative design to the scientists, they learn something. But sometimes we actually do workshops together and with the scientists uh, as, as artists, you, you, let's, let's try to think of doing something co-creating. And then we also, I'm also quite always try to enforce for scientists to learn about the process of art. So we have a lot of art lectures, design thinking lectures, because we are, our institute is, I, I love the way we work, we are very collaborative, but we are still sort of stuck in the same way of thinking of a scientific process. And we do need to sort of find inspiration how we think of science. So it's very important to think, look at these other processes of art. How does it originate and so on. So that's why we have this process of art. And then we have this dialogue driven uh, where artists meet with one or one or uh, like two people for an evening and they go for, I encourage everybody like the artists and the scientists to go for a walk. We have really nice places to walk around the campus, go for a walk and discover like the different things and to uh, find collaborations. <clears throat> so the project started in uh, 20, 18, and we had this first artist, uh, Kyoto from Kyoto, who is artist in residence for, focused on uh, early isotopes uh, from the beginning of the universe, which still exist. So, and I'll go through some of the annually, and then I'll explain some of these in later on. And uh, we then we had a so some of them are artists that are in residence, and some of them some of these are just art project one off. And uh, we also wanted to capture the essence of LC, our institute. We, it's very in interdisciplinary, very open, uh, very nice. I, you're welcome to visit. It's a very nice uh, building. And uh, so we wanted to, we, we had an artist visiting us for a couple of weeks, just hanging around, observing how researchers work, talking to them, and to capture what is the essence of LC. And I really like this because he, the Banai san was like, oh, there's people drink a lot of coffee, we do, and we cycle, most of us cycle to work, uh, and then a lot of us go on hikes and uh, we hang out with our families, we babysit uh, everybody else's kids, so it's so much of like a family-friendly environment at Elsie, 
and uh, we also do sample collections and we study from core of the earth and all the way to the planets and universe and so on. So he managed to capture this essence of like science and life at LC. And, uh, and then we had uh, another artist in residence, uh, uh, Iranian artist based in Japan, uh, who worked with the people who are a group of scientists working on water-based world. We, are, we call them water worlds. And we don't know what they look like, but we imagine they have water. And uh, so it, in this conversation, it helps also the ideas to, for scientists to sort of use their imagination, what kind of worlds that they are trying to develop look like and what kind of environment actually could be. And this took so long because, I mean, this Im image is not very clear, but this is done by a toothpick. So it took forever to actually build this. And uh, in 2021, fiscal year, we had the, this Brazilian artist in uh, Japan working with uh, researchers who are working in labs. And this is really interesting because uh, in labs, we are, and, and this is specifically for people who use a microscope. A lot of the times you look through a mic microscope, you're looking at a black and white image. We don't think about the smell, color, and so on. We think about the things we want to understand. And this art is almost challenged the researchers to think about what does your virus smell like? What does your bacteria sound like? So we really push the limits to think about this, like the colors and the smell and the sound of viruses and bacteria. And, and while doing so, interesting things came up like for contributing to science where we have this, we, have, we, we used to have a uh, scientific area called messy chemistry, and which I still love. Uh, we don't continue that, but we, that's part of a process that you do science without planning in the lab. It's called messy chemistry. So that was uh, started at LC. And, uh, and also in astronomy, I'm from astronomy, and if somebody's in astronomy, we have a, all the, some of the beautiful images we saw today, these are all the colors are assigned, and you can ad identify certain ingredients by the colors. But in our work, we don't do that particularly, but we could. So we also used a, sort of a color scheme to understand like the behavior of the bacteria and viruses. So that's sort of way to understand, like identify certain groups. And, uh, and then fiscal year 2022 was a bit of a challenge because we went into complex systems. Complex system is sort of like looking at, nobody knows what it is. And, but imagine you're trying to understand the behavior at the Shubia crossing and to have a model for it. So it's sort of like that but for origin of life. And, but this was a really interesting way to get everybody working in complex, complex systems to come together to find a way, uh, because the, some of them are more organic, some of them are more systematic and mechanical. And so this artist spent a lot of time discussing with the scientists, how do we sort of uh, come up with these ideologies for complex systems? And then, uh, and up to this point, one of the things, I want to talk about budget, which is important, uh, because budget for art, especially at a research institute, is all the way at the bottom. And it's almost like if you have some pocket money left, this is for art. So, but one of the things uh, I worked hard is to secure a budget for three years when I, from our institutional budget when we started. And I promised that the director back then that I will take care of it, the continuation of the project. It was a big, uh, bold move by me, but luckily, uh, Tokyo has a lot of really good companies, Adobe, Google, and so on. And uh, we are at an interesting place where we are focused on astrobiology and origin of life, and then bringing in art is quite unique. So there's this angle of trying to, like, understanding life in the universe through art is a very kind of interesting point for some of these companies. So from here onwards, everything got funded externally. And so we brought in Adobe Japan uh, as a creative uh, 
supporter and we look we wanted to we finished the ten first ten years of our institute and so we were looking the next ten years of the institute and we wanted the artist to sort of imagine we we gave this artist a fifty page document saying this is the plan of a strategy for next ten years. Can you imagine that? And this is what we came up what the uh, Dan came up with that we are focused a bit more on sample mission, uh, sample return, uh, return missions and Mars and a lot of more geology. And, uh, and now we have artists funded by completely externally uh, going forward. Uh, and we also sort of focused uh, on doing more collaborative work as well. So, and currently we are working on uh, a project that I'm very excited for the next two years with JAXA, which is a, which is a space agency for Japan, that JAXA ha, ha, had this uh, mission that went to, uh, went to an asteroid and brought back down some samples, uh, Hybrisa 2, and we have uh, one of the sample grains. So this is a unique opportunity for an artist to work with a sample grain out of this world from an asteroid and creatively imagine how, what kind of art can, can you actually uh, form this into. Because pretty much all the samples that humans brought back from other asteroids, comets, and so on, are so far mostly focused on scientific research. And we have done some outreach, but this is one of the unique ways that we combine, we have a give the opportunity for an artist to work with a sample grain from an asteroid, which I mean, how cool is that? So it, this is sort of why it really, art is important at a research institute that you give access and you also change the way you think about scientific process. I think all the speakers in the morning, we were talking a little bit, talking about this, you know, why, what does this mean for the scientists, the science research institute, because we also had to justify this and lastly, I want to leave, uh, this is something I didn't think about, but happened, how much of a cultural impact science and art has. So OIST has these wonderful images when you walk around. And I, at LC, we have this, all the work done by artists visible on our corridor. And we have these high school students coming in, public coming in time to time. Every month we have high school students coming in. And and one day I was overhearing this student was saying that I'm actually not interested in becoming a scientist, but I really love art. And I never thought you have artists in a science institute. And this is the sort of the culture. When I say culture, I'm thinking, talking about this culture that we think about work, we think about our careers and so on, like for the future. So we have such a big cultural impact through doing science and art getting these younger next generation to think about careers beyond becoming a scientist or artist, more interdisciplinary, so it's a really good way to go forward. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you have, uh, I think we have time for one quick question. Okay. Someone else? <laughs> Thank you, Dilna, so much for this presentation. And I was very interested when you were talking about the artist that wor was working with like the microscopic images. So uh, recently I had a conversation with a scientist, and she, was, she works with proteins. And she was telling me, when you see the protein in the microscope, it looks like it's expanding. And I really want to connect with an artist to kind of convey the sense of expansion when you look at the proteins and what we do with the proteins. And I think this is what we, this is the moment that we're waiting for, like to connect with artists and scientists because they know that they want to convey this sense too. So I think that what you're doing with artists and scientists is fantastic, congratulations. And I know it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's tough, so what you have done is just amazing. Thanks yeah. so much for this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Selena. Uh, Selena, um, just another plug, is hosting a webinar tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock, Japan Standard Time. Uh, so tomorrow morning on decolonizing science. Uh, registration is required, but it's free. It's also part of the Science Summit at the UNGA, so please ask them for details afterwards. Okay, last but not least. 
Dr. Shinichi Kasahara is a project leader and researcher at Sony Computer Science Laboratories. At the same time, he's a visiting research researcher at OIST, and he is running the Cybernetic Humanity Studio, a collaboration, which we've already heard about, uh, between Sony CSL and OIST that is exploring the new humanity that is emerging from the integration of humans and computers. Please welcome Shun. Hello, uh, nice to meet you, and I'm super glad to hear the great introduction. Thank you so much. So let me prepare my slide. Actually, I saw it in somewhere, so it's, this is it. Well, right. So, still, I have. Do I have some time? Right. Still. Okay. Gotcha. So let before oh, I forgot. Let me do some timer as well. Right, so uh, nice to meet you. My name is Shunichi Kasahara from Sony Computer Science Laboratory. Also, I'm uh, right now the Sony Computer Science Laboratory, which is Sony CSL, and OIS is now at the collaborating uh, the research project called Cybernetic Humanity. And then upon the, this collaboration, actually, I'm very happy and also thank you for the OIS to giving some such an opportunity because now we are, uh, I have uh, some studio, uh, research studio in a newly built uh, Lab 5 in OIST. Yeah, and a very nice place. And uh, uh, we are now uh, working on the, the research talking about the cybernetic humanity, which is I will talk about later. But today I actually a uh, little bit talking about this, my project from the point of the art experience. So the, my background is like, uh, I, I can say like my background is actually threefold. The one is a researcher, so I'm researching about human computer interaction, psychology, and also the computer science, something like this. So I'm writing a paper, I'm doing some experiment with a human, and I write writing a code for the paper, something I do research. The also, the um, partially my background is actually engineer, so I'm doing so also like building some system to interact with systems or. I, like uh, in the software development and the de designing the interactive systems. And then the third point, third part is kind of the important for me, is actually, uh, it's a little bit awkward to say myself as an artist, but I actually today here, I actually also working as an artist because the way, the way that is a very important aspect of the, my research cycles because how we can make this research into the society and also how we can involve the society into the research cycle. To, to make it these cycles, I actually doing some art work for the making research into the experience. So the, the, the main point, main, my research theme is actually cybernetic humanity is the, how we can define the, ourselves when we computer and human integrated together. So maybe we might say, oh, that is something like very sci like a sci-fi something, but I, now we are already know about AI is coming up and they usually everyone have a phone and everyone might have some chat GPT application, something like this. And then right now we know us like we are talking to physically. But you can also imagine, okay, so in the, maybe like one half, one, one half or maybe two years later, we can also talk over the AI agent instead to myself. Even so, let's say we can also think about like automatic translation, something. So even we are now, so for instance, Zoom meeting, we are gonna make face to face video face chat, but actually this communication is over the mediated by computer. In some sense, we are already included or, it, or we are already integrated with computer, right? So in that case, uh, we have to also think about, so in this case, how we can define ourselves? Because okay, so we, with the computer, we can get new abilities. We can get new appearance, for instance. But in this case, okay, that what was myself? And then if we cannot define myself, it is actually a very disaster because of the technology go beyond and we can lose ourselves. It is a very bad scenario of the communication or uh, the technology evolves. So how we can define, how we can balance this kind of element, I want to think about like, okay, how we can define ourselves with computer and human integrated. So that sounds like a very, sorry, so uh, it's, this research is kind of including many topics, like uh, including some action, body, and identity of society. But I, I, I want I will not touch on the every project right now. But I, I want to talk about like uh, okay, how we can go, how we can proceed with this research with community society. 
This is actually important part, uh, talk of the part of the, my talk is a science through art experience. Because now you are hearing cybernetic humanity and a little bit, okay, a little bit too much and a little bit like a, not so much close to myself. But how we can involve these researches, uh, the participant? So I want to using art experience. For instance, I will, I will um, introduce one uh, example of the project, which is like a, my project. This is shadow. Okay, you see? This is my shadow. We already know that this is like a project of myself. So this is most simple existence of the projecting myself, right? Okay, so this is my body and this is my body shadow, right? But what if this shadow, shadow is transformed and changing the, the shape? How we feel? And what kind of the change make us change the sense of the body, right? And we actually created some like art experience with changing the real shadow. That is called the fragment shadow with a collaboration with the south of Higa and the, uh, the Leo Canada and the Akihiro Komori. Right, so the, um, let me play the video. So you see the video, hopefully it's a playing. You see the, in the screen and also the shadow is projected into the screen. But uh, if you can cross, crossly see the screen, the shadow is actually fragmented in real time very unique way. What is happening behind these things is actually we put lots of projectors behind the screen and the project the images into the screen and also calibrate the this geometry and the color very precisely. This is more a computer science part. By doing so, we actually can transform the black shadow into the colored, textured shadow, something like this. So you know like uh, our shadow is just black, but right now it's kind of colored and then textured and then something is going, something happened in the, my own shadow. Right? We can also doing some like a sh changing the geometry and the shape in the shadow, changing the light. The one point, this is not computer reprojection of the shadow. This is real physical shadow. So this is no latency, this is ultimate resolution. But still you feel, oh, my shadow is changing. This is actually changing the, uh, so of course in the behind this scene, there are tons of the computational, like computer graphics, uh, also like computer graphics researches and also like a computer science research going on, but I, that's very long story, so I will just cut the something. But by using this technology, uh, we are actually also doing some exp uh, exhibition in the Tokyo and also like uh, other, um, um, the US and also Las Vegas and also Lopongi Hills. So for instance, that is an example of the flag and shadow. You see how shadow is fragmented into the screen, right? This is still real shadow, but still, oh, my shadow is fragmented. And then I feel like, oh, my body is also fragmented. And also, like we are working on the with some like uh, the art, the old artwork of the Andy Warhol Kyoto uh, in the some like collaboration with Kyoto. But I, anyway, what, why we, we are, why I'm doing this is actually, I want to create some moment of the wonder by imagining the participant or public society into this experience. For instance, this is very in, 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 interesting moment. She is very wondering. Oh, is it my shadow? Or not? Okay, maybe I can just uh, break back again, right? So like uh, this is like uh, they are enjoying, and then she started. Oh, this is my shadow. This is myself. Mm, yeah, it looks like myself, <laughs> right? But uh, this is also like what we want because like uh, it's also like uh, we can also I'm doing also like, doing some like a psychological experiment and uh, control the experiment in lab lab laboratory. But I, in some point, also I'm doing some kind of research activities research into the, some kind of the immersive experience, experiment, experience. So what I'm doing, uh, actually doing some, building some technology and the systems, and that, that is going to be like uh, doing some exhibition in the on-site. And from the on-site, we actually extra extract some human behavior, and then we actually do some science on top of that uh, experience. I think I'm not so much having some time, but I, I just want to touch on some other project is like identity. So quickly playing the other project. But uh, this morphing identity project is actually uh, the swapping the faces between together. This is also what at work. And then two persons coming in the booth and then you see half face, okay? So light left to side. 
she's her face, right? And then they actually can talk each other. But uh, gradually, by talking, their face is actually going to be moved together. And then finally, it's actually been swapped. <laughs> and then this is the moment of they found like the supplies. But the moment, that is also a very interesting experience. But also, this is giving us the question, OK, what is the self? And how much can we feel this is myself or not? So from this experiment, um, I'm doing some, from this kind of exhibition, we are actually building the system and they exhibit this ex uh, the artwork in the many occasions. And after that, we extracted some research question from the, this e exhibition and then doing some research paper. So we are actually doing based on the re exhibit. We are also like doing some, you know, the psychology, sci uh, phys psychological experiment with the uh, technology. Then they publish a paper, of course. But what we want to say, I want to say is that now the art, art is kind of power to involve those society into the research cycle. And then also it is not like just like coming, asking the participant, but also giving some new experience for the participant, uh, no, sorry, society. Okay, so to doing some accelerating this, pro, uh, the, uh, to, to accelerating this, the activities, uh, from last year, uh, we started to submit humanity studio at OIST level five, this is a very fast day of the Lab 5. And then that is uh, our team member on the Simon and Humanity Studio. Right. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, very happy to have any comment or question. I'm very happy to. Had a, we had a, a person from like the Japan Times in here, and he approached me in the break, and he asked a very interesting question: What motivates a scientist to work in a sci art projects? So, yes, from your perspective, what do you say? Okay, so um, from my okay, maybe that's a very personal perspective from myself, but for me, it's like uh, of course, in points that you from your talk, it's like. Uh, you know, the scientist, artist, is kind of different, you know, disciplinary and also different existence. But if, to me, uh, I'm trying to be both. I'm trying to be a researcher, and also at the same time, I'm trying to be an uh, artist. Because like, I sometimes I'm trying to be, uh, you know, the science is, of, of course, this as, because this is, the, that is uh, important of the, this cycle. To me, it's an like artist, creating artwork and the art experience, and then inviting some public society is part of the experiment. It is very awkward to say, but also this is a very interesting moment that I can also observe how society will react to those new technologies. This is kind of, this is, these kind of things cannot be seen in the laboratory, actually. Because the laboratory, oh, we are doing some experiment, and then please come in and then doing some experiment. It's very controlled. But once we are doing some art experience and then they are enjoying and they are doing some new experience, and then they react some new phenomenon, that's a moment we can find a new science. So from that point of view, I guess like I'm trying to be both. And then I, th I think that's a, I think that's a big because I'm enjoying those both and then happy. I, I don't know, that's a, I hope that's gonna be also like a good, like a, you know, template for other researchers. Excellent. So much food for thought, my goodness. I couldn't help but notice how many times uh, the word wonder came up, came up several times this afternoon, which uh, I just think is brilliant and beautiful. Um, we have an official survey here. Please fill it up. It'll stay up for a while. Um, but without, without going quite there, let's do a little check-in with a show of hands. Um, uh, how many are thinking about art and science in a new way? How many are leaving with a little ex extra inspiration in their back pocket today? Good, good, excellent. Okay, mission accomplished. <laughs> um, today's event was made possible. Thanks so much to our awesome, awesome speakers. Thank you so much. Yes, an extra clap. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for sharing your knowledge, your experience, and your passion with all of us. Also, thank you so much to Tomomi, to Natsu, Hitomi, and Ileana, and others at OIST for working behind the scenes. 
Thank you very much to the organizing committee uh, from the Science Summit at the UN General Assembly for supporting us. Thank you for helping us share this topic with a broad audience in, in New York and around the world. In addition, support today was provided by Jay Peaks from Japan's Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technologies program for forming Japan's peak research universities. And Thanks to all of you for joining in person and online. We appreciate your interest in OIST, in UNU, and in SIART. So thank you so much. Have a good day, and please fill out the form. Thank you.